Hello readers, I'm the Avid Reader and today we're reviewing Liberating Atlantis written by Harry Turtledove in 2009. This novel takes place in 1852 and it's about a slave uprising in Atlantis which takes place in an alternate universe where you have the American East Coast split off and being its own island in the middle of the Atlantic. And the slave uprising in this novel in 1852 involves blacks and it involves Native Americans which are called in this novel Copperskins oddly enough. You have three point of view characters in this book. So you have Frederick Radcliffe who is the grandson of Victor Radcliffe who led the Atlantean rebellion but he is only one quarter white and three quarters black. So he is a house slave for a southern plantation owner. The two other perspectives you have are the councils of the Atlantean Senate. So you have Leland Newton, who's a consul from the north, and then you have Jeremiah Stafford, who's a consul from the south. And of course, northerners oppose slavery, southerners are in favor of slavery. And in this universe, you have the enslavement of blacks and of Native Americans or copper skins. And before I get into the story, I can say that this novel is a fine addition to this trilogy and makes a good third and final act. So the story starts out with Frederick Radcliffe, a house slave, spilling soup on the mistress of the house. So then he gets five lashes on his back and he becomes a field hand. So now he has to work in the plantation as a slave with a hoe. And in the first few dozen pages, you really understand how horrible the life of a slave is in the South. Now, house slaves had it a little better than field hands, and it varied from plantation to plantation. So this plantation was less cruel than other plantations, but still it is pretty bad. And after a few days as a field hand, you have some Atlantean soldiers who arrive, and they are sick with the yellow jack, so they're staying there, and they have a bunch of guns with them. And you have a scene where the lieutenant talks with Frederick, and he kind of suggests to him that maybe he should rise up, oddly. This man is from the north, so he opposes slavery, of course, oddly. And you have soldiers getting sick and dying from the yellow jack. After that, Frederick decides, I'm gonna start a slave uprising. So the next morning, he takes his hoe, and when you have the overseer who comes around, he thrusts it into his face and then he trusts again to kill him and he takes his knife and they start going around and killing the soldiers quietly and take their guns and there's a shot fired so then you have the plantation owner Barfor who comes out with a gun ready to shoot but you have the cook who knives him in the back of the head so he kills over and dies. Then you have one of the female slaves who goes up and kills the mistress. So now the slaves have control of the plantation and they have a bunch of guns. So they start going from plantation to plantation, liberating the slaves and killing the owners. And Frederick is the leader of this uprising. And his second in command is Lorenzo, who's a native. Later in the book, we shift to the perspective of Leland Newton and Jeremy Stafford, and you get to see the debates in the Atlantean Senate of what they should do with the slave uprisings in the southern states, as slavery has been illegal in the north for a while. And Leland Newton is informed by a senator that if he does not send an army down there, then someone may kill him. So as consuls, they are the commander in chief of the army. So they go down there with the army as peacekeepers. And the soldier in charge is Colonel Sinapis, who's a European officer who immigrated to the United States. They travel on train, but you have some shots fired at them by the insurrectionists, so Newton agrees they have to fight them. Because you have a power sharing thing here. On one day, one consul commands, on the other, the other consul commands. So you have an alternating commander-in-chief between Leland Newton and Jeremy Stafford. And of course, Jeremy Stafford, who's a southern man and he owns slaves, he wants to be more aggressive than Leland Newton. And Colonel Sinapis is not that aggressive as an officer and follows the rules of war. And we get to see some fighting between the insurrectionists and the soldiers. Eventually, the slaves capture a train convoy of ammunition. So you have the soldiers who retreat to New Marseille, where they get reinforced by militiamen who are slave owners, and they are a lot more bloodthirsty than regular soldiers. And the slaves under Frederick and Lorenzo, they have some different guerrilla tactics. So for example, they put up barricades when they fight, which kills a lot of soldiers. And Jeremy Stafford courses Sinapis to act more aggressively in battle by basically saying, if you fail, your name is going to be mud. And that works at first, but you have a final battle where the soldiers and the militiamen are trying to get over the barricade, but they don't notice that the insurrectionists are outflanking them on the sides. 
and from behind too and they realize what's happening after it's too late so a lot of soldiers and militiamen start getting killed you have a flag of truce where the insurrectionists basically ask surrender or you will be massacred you give your guns and we will let you go back to new marseille or new hastings after some thoughts they reluctantly agree so they surrender to the insurrectionists and then they negotiate a peace treaty basically that gives amnesty to the insurrectionists for war crimes and that blacks and natives are going to be equal to whites and they're gonna have the same rights the same privileges the same duties and you will no longer have slavery and during the book we see stafford shifting from someone who hates blacks and sees them as inferior through slowly realizing through their fighting capability and through speaking with Frederick and Lorenzo that they actually may be equal to whites. So they signed the treaty, they send it back to New Hastings and they return to New Hastings with Frederick who is going to be there as a witness of why they should free the slaves. But when they come back to New Hastings they learn that there has been a slave uprising in Guernica. And Guernica is one of the newer states in the Atlantean Union so it belonged to Spain until 30 years ago and you have still a bunch of Spaniards there. The slaves there weren't waiting for the Senate to free the slaves so they just rose up. So now Frederick goes down there to negotiate a ceasefire and he succeeds. And after that he returns and he had had an agreement with the Southern Senator. Okay, I get a ceasefire. You're gonna back us freeing the slaves. But that Senator goes back on his word. So you have some slaves who start making his life hell. So they do everything bad. So he changes his mind. And then you have a motion in the Atlantean Senate. Will we free the slaves? And the most northerners vote yes, a lot of southerners vote no, but in the end you have the resolution that passes. And now slavery has ended and the novel ends with Frederick marrying a woman called Helen because slaves were not allowed to get married before but now as they're free they're allowed to get married. So that's a beautiful ending. So how would I rate Liberating Atlantis? I'm gonna give it a 10 out of 10. Another amazing book in this trilogy. This is an amazing trilogy by Harry Turtle Love. And in this book, in the first few dozen pages, you understand how despicable slavery is. And then you understand how necessary it is in an uprising to be initially quite bloodthirsty. So you have to kill people without hesitating initially. And then eventually you can start following the laws of war. And by reading this book, you can see the allegory of how the American Congress was in a dilemma of how do we abolish slavery since the North wanted to abolish slavery, but the South did not. And there's a lot of great action in this novel also. You get to understand how a guerrilla war works and how it can succeed. This novel makes clear, of course, that no race is a better soldier than another. Any race can be a great commander. So I would definitely recommend this amazing novel, Liberating Atlantis. And overall, I'm gonna recommend you to read the Atlantis trilogy. So in the first novel, Opening Atlantis, you have the settlement in the 15th century, you have piracy in the 17th century, and you have the war between the French and the British in the 18th century. In the United States of Atlantis, you have the Atlantean War of Independence against the British. And finally, in this novel, Liberating Atlantis, you have a slave uprising that succeeds in liberating the slaves. And ostensibly now you're gonna have equality between blacks and whites. So, Harry Turtledove, you've written an amazing trilogy. However, if you wanna learn about the worst book I've read by Harry Turtledove, then I would recommend you to check out my review of Ruled Britannia. It's about Shakespeare and the Spanish controlling Britain, but it's a lot slower and boring read. Anyways, I'm David Reader, and I will see you readers next time.